Good morning, everyone. Um, we are about to embark on the 36th hearing of this 169th period of sessions in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I must recognize the fact that the Dean, Dean James Ananya, is present, and, and Professor Jim, James, Jim, James Cavaliero of Stanford <laughs> University, ex-commissioner and president of the Inter-American Commission. Thank you all for, thank both of you for being here. I'm sorry I cannot recognize all the um, people, August people who I see here present because I don't know you, I know them. <laughs> so, but I do welcome every single person in this room. We are particularly happy that the state is present at this hearing of these two cases, which I'll mention shortly, um, because it is very helpful when the state is here to respond um, to what the petitioners um, submit. Um, we are here to deal with case number 13.154, which relates to 4 million US cit citizen residents in citizens resident in Puerto Rico, and case number 13.326, Pedro Rosario and four million US citizens who are also resident in Puerto Rico of the United States. Um, the hearing on this matter, these cases, um, was requested by the petitioners who are here present. Thank you for being here. And um, they are pre present to be heard on both cases. Um, we do have a definitive list of participants um, for um, each delegation, but not available here to me. The purpose of the hearing was request, as requested by the petitioners in the two cases is to produce testimony of one of the alleged victims, Pedro Rosario, former governor of Puerto Rico, to sub and submit the pleadings on the merit. Um, the, before I start, I, I, will, I do have a statement um, to make. Um, I must commence this hearing by pointing out that according to Article 64 of the Rules of Procedure, uh, only the, our Rules of Procedure, only the parties, that is the petitioners and the state, are allowed to speak in the hearings concerning individual cases. And of course, if there was advance notice of witnesses who would, who would give evidence. I inform the parties and the audience in this matter that the Commission received a request from Governor Ricardo Roselio and Senator Eduardo Batia, 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 in order to intervene during the hearing in their respective official capacities. capacities. The Commission rejected these requests pursuant to the said Article 64 of our Rules of Procedure. I reiterate the, this position and clarify that according to international law and the practice of the Commission, the United States is represented before the Inter-American Commission in all matters on human rights by the federal government. Um, for those who are not uh, acquainted with our rules, it is the parties, an individual party makes a complaint against the state, it is the state, the fed, if it's a federal state, the federal authority and state of that state party um, of the Organization of American State, which is, deals with the Inter-American Commission. So I, I hope that clarifies the position of the um, commission in that regard. We have to make disclosure because of transparency, uh, which is a principle we believe in. Um, the structure, the hearing will be structured as follows. There will be a declaration by the witness Pedro Rosario, and um, that 
the petitioners will have 10 minutes to question him. The state is offered 10 minutes as well to question the witness. And they may, we may have some questions for the witness ourselves in the, within a period of five minutes. Then there will be final arguments. I will remind you of these as we go along. Um, by the petitioners of 25 minutes which would be 12 and a half minutes for each petitioner. And then the arguments of the state will be 25 minutes. And any possible comments or questions by us will be 15 minutes. I hope we do have the time to do all that. Um, without uh, wasting any further time with me blabbing on, I invite the petitioners to make their submission. Good morning. Buenos dias. My name is Orlando Vidal. I represent petitioners in the Rosselló case. Thank you for convening this important hearing. I'd like quickly to introduce to you our petitioners and our delegation before turning it over to the declarant. At, uh, in front of you, at the witness stand, is Pedro Rosselló. Dr. Rosselló is a former two-term governor, senator, pediatric surgeon and now president of the Equality Commission, which Puerto Rico established as its shadow delegation to Congress, consisting of two senators and five representatives. Dr. Rosselló serves as a shadow representative. The former governor has dedicated almost his entire life to the cause of equality for the American citizens of Puerto Rico. Here to the, my right is Luis Berrios, he is the head of our other petitioner, the Unfinished Business of American Democracy Committee. Mr. Barrios, too, is a shadow representative. I'd like to take an opportunity also to introduce to you some of the members of our delegation from Puerto Rico. The governor of Puerto Rico, Ricardo Rosselló, is in the audience, as well as the president of Puerto Rico Senate, Thomas Rivera Schatz, the speaker of Puerto Rico's House of Representatives, Johnny Mendez, is here and Puerto Rico's Secretary of State and Lieutenant Governor Luis Rivera is also here. Our delegation represents almost the entire political leadership of the government of Puerto Rico. Their presence here highlights how important these issues are. I'll have an opportunity to address the commission later and present argument. For now, we offer the testimony of former Puerto Rico governor and petitioner in this case, Pedro Rosselló. I understand the commission is going to administer the oath. Governor yes. Rosselló, would you stand up, please? Uh, I am Governor. Do you swear or promise to tell the truth about the facts you're going to testify about? I do. Thank you. Dr. Rosselló, would you please introduce yourself and proceed with your remarks? Thank you. <clears throat> Madam President, Commissioners, Ambassador Rodrigo, thank you for the opportunity to address you today. My name is Pedro Rosselló. I am a United States citizen. I reside in Puerto Rico. I'm approximately one of 3.5 million U.S. citizens who live there. I don't have the right to vote for president. I don't have the right to vote for vice president. I don't have the right to vote for voting representatives in the Congress or U.S. Senators. None of my fellow citizens in the island has any of these rights. And that is wrong. That is absolutely wrong. We are petitioning this commission to answer the question whether this state of affair meets human rights standards under international law. In particular, we are asking whether this situation Violet, violates human rights consecrated in the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man. The Commission now has a singular and unique opportunity to stand with the people of Puerto Rico to recognize the violation and to call the United States government to remedy it. I sincerely hope this Commission will do just that. I will address some of the salient facts in the limited time available and let the lawyers present our legal arguments. There are 10 factual points. Number one, 
Puerto Ricans are proud Americans. We have been U.S. citizens for the past 101 years. Since Congress bestowed citizenship to Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricans in 1917. Number two, we live in a territory that has belonged to the United States for the past 120 years, since 1898, at the conclusion of the Spanish-American War. We don't live in a foreign country. We're not refugees. We're not immigrants. We're not expats. We're Americans on American soil. But we live in a jurisdiction, Puerto Rico, that could justifiably be described as a geographic civil rights ghetto within our nation. Number three, federal law applies to us with full force and effect. Like everywhere else in the U.S., federal law is supreme in Puerto Rico. Unlike in the 50 states, however, Puerto Rico, we have no domestic rights whatsoever to elect voting members of Congress, which passes legislation that affects us, nor the right to elect the president who turns congressionally approved legislation into law and who enforces that law. We don't even have the right to influence through our vote who the federal judges are and they interpret the laws we live under. We are completely and entirely excluded from the political process at every level of the federal government, legislative, executive, and judicial. Point four, our sons upon turning 18 have to register with a selective service and were once subject to cons conscription. Many more Puerto Rican soldiers, airmen, sailors, and Marines have served bravely and with distinction have fought and also have been wounded, disabled, and died per capita more than in, in, in the sons of many sons and daughters throughout the states. None of them had, none of these servicemen had, nor do the active duty service men and women now from Puerto Rico have today the right to vote for the commander in chief who sends them to war, nor for the voting congressmen and women with the power to, under the Constitution, to declare war. Five, while most Puerto Rico residents are exempt from federal personal income tax, there are many exceptions. Everyone in Puerto Rico has to pay federal personal income taxes on any worldwide income. Everyone in Puerto Rico has to pay federal personal income taxes on any income earned in any of the states. All federal employees in Puerto Rico have to pay federal personal income taxes. And we also pay a myriad of other federal taxes such as the federal social security taxes, the federal Medicare taxes, federal unemployment insurance payroll taxes, federal import taxes, and federal export uh, taxes, and federal commodity taxes, just to name a few. An analysis based on data appearing in The Economist indicates that we from Puerto Rico pay more in federal taxes than approximately six states, Alaska, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Vermont, and Wyoming. Number six. There are over 40 federal programs that either don't include Puerto Rico at all or discriminate against Puerto Rico and its residents. My seventh point, we are and we were appalled, although perhaps not surprised, by the opposition to our submission on the merits filed by the government of the United States. What shocked us, and that includes, I dare say, every one of the 3.5 million citizens was the U.S. government's statement to the effect that, and I quote, Puerto Rico is self-governing, -govern end of quote. This is perhaps the most egregious misstatement by the government of the United States in the past 12 years that we've been litigating this case before the commission. I can categorically state to this commission and to the United States government that we in Puerto Rico are most certainly not self-governing. That is the whole problem. It is preposterous for the United States government to claim that Puerto Rico is self-governing. The U.S. Supreme Court has repeatedly held we're not sovereign, that whatever authority our territorial has is one derived exclusively from Congress. Today, our local government is under fe a federally uh, supervision 
through a federally imposed fiscal control board with vast, broad, and expansive powers over every locally elected government official and any local governmental action. These people are effectively acting as Puerto Rico's overlords. But we had nothing to do with their appointment. We had no authority over them. They are not accountable in the least to the U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico. To add insult to injury, Congress has not even assigned any funds to cover the work of the Junta. The, the hundreds of millions of dollars the U.S. Congressional Budget Office estimates that the Junta's operating expenses are costing us are by federal law required to be incurred by the U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico, not by the federal government. Are we self-governing? The U.S. government's claim would be laughable were it not simply and utterly false. Eighth, and importantly, I would be remiss not to mention last year's hurricanes. Everyone knows, in fact, the whole world saw how the U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico are discriminated against. They did not and are still not receiving the same help and assistance our fellow citizens in the states received following natural disasters. Approximately 3,000 people died, despite the fact that the president continues to deny the death toll. Number nine, in the submission on its merit, the U.S. government at least recognizes that Puerto Ricans demanded equality when we overwhelmingly chose statehood in last year's referendum. The United States government, however, ignored in its submission the fact that this is the second time we've chosen statehood, not the first. We also chose statehood in 2012. In any event, I want to make clear that we're not asking the commission to fix the colonial status of Puerto Rico. Only Congress can and must fix it. We're also not asking the commission to rule on the constitutionality under the domestic laws of the United States of the exclusion of U.S. citizens from Puerto Rico from the federal franchise. We recognize, of course, that, un that under the U.S. Constitution, only residents of states have voting rights. The question, however, in this case is, it is not whether the U.S. is complying with its own domestic laws, but whether it is complying with the requirements of the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man. The U.S. government would do well to remember that once upon a time, that same U.S. Constitution protected slavery. That, of course, didn't make slavery right, just like it isn't right for the U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico to be denied voting rights at the federal level. What we're asking the commission is to clearly, unequivocally, and loudly declare that while Puerto Rico remains a part of the United States, while we're still citizens of the United States, and while the federal law still applies to us, we're entitled under the applicable human rights standards under international law to vote in federal elections for president, vice president, senators, and voting representatives to Congress. The solution is not what the United States government proposes in its submission on the merits. That if we want equality, all we have to do is to move to one of the 50 states. The United States government's answer is akin to an argument that slaves in the South could escape to the North and that that was enough to remedy slavery. Well, it wasn't. Like it is not enough to remedy the inequality of U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico. My tenth and final point, the United States government uh, it states in its submission on the merits that our submissions contain, and I quote, many factual misstatements, end of quote. That is incorrect. We have presented no alternative facts here. There are no factual misstatements in our submissions. In any event, the government of the United States doesn't identify any. The United States government is trying here to defend the indefensible. And I hope the commission can see clearly through that and rule for the petitioners and the U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico in our cases. Thank you for this opportunity to address you, for the work you do promoting and protecting human rights, and for your attention today. 
I welcome at the appropriate time any questions you may have for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now the petitioners um, can question. The state, I beg your pardon, first, yes. The state should can question the witness. Sorry. Distinguished commissioners, good morning. My name is Carlos Trujillo, and I'm the United States Ambassador to the Organization of American States. Once again, it's an honor and privilege to be here today. Thank you for this opportunity to question the witness. At this time, we will defer questioning the witness, and I will turn the floor over to my colleague, Thomas Weatherall, a lawyer with the State Department, to go into more detail. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Madam President, as you know, not until yesterday did we know the identity of the witness, and not until today did we have any idea of the subject matter of this witness's testimony. This made it impossible, as you can well understand, for us to prepare questions in any meaningful way. Uh, moreover, these are petitions of considerable complexity, and they have a long history spanning more than a decade. And so we hereby reserve the balance of our time for the present witness and ask that that time, approximately 10 minutes, be added to our longer presentation. Thank you for your consideration. Yes, we can see. We, we agree to that. Um, you are willing. You can do that. Thank you, you Madam wish. President. Uh, um, no. So, are you, question, are you can No, it's us. We, we have to ask questions okay. now. Yes. Um, you know, no, you know, no, no questions? However. And Commissioner Hernandez will ask questions. My sister commissioner has, has none. Thank you. Muchas gracias, señor Rosselló. Yo tengo dos preguntas para, para usted, si es posible contestárnosla conforme a lo que la, el conocimiento, la información que usted tiene del caso. Eh, la pregunta, en su opinión, ¿cuál es la finalidad que se busca con esta diferencia de trato en derechos políticos entre los ciudadanos de Estados Unidos en general versus los ciudadanos de los Estados Unidos en Puerto Rico. Y segundo, en, si en opinión de usted esta distinción tiene una razón más histórica que jurídica que pueda tener alguna explicación eh, de tipo histórico que nos permita a nosotros tener un elemento de juicio adicional para entender la petición de, eh, en este caso. Gracias. Señor comisionado. Eh... No, 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 Yes, but, but you can remind me then what the question was. <laughs> well, in that case, I suggest you answer now. <laughs> if I recall, the, uh, perdón, uh, si recuerdo bien, la pr primera pregunta era sobre intención. ¿Es correcto? Si es sobre intención, en realidad hay que preguntarle al gobierno de Estados Unidos cuál es la intención de mantener esta situación que es obviamente violatoria de derechos humanos basado en la declaración americana eh, que prevalece y que guía a esta comisión. Es una situación anómala. La intención podemos especular, pero no debe ser necesario especular. Ahora, pregunta sobre posibles elementos históricos que puedan dar base a lo que está ocurriendo en estos momentos. Y tiene razón. Los elementos históricos se basan en los conceptos de territorios en la historia de los Estados Unidos. Después de 13 colonias británicas que se unen para formar lo que hoy conocemos como los Estados Unidos de América, en 37 ocasiones han habido territorios que han solicitado admisión como Estado en igualdad de condiciones con los demás estados y los demás ciudadanos. 37 veces ha ocurrido eso. 
En el caso de Puerto Rico sigue un patrón similar, excepto que por unas decisiones jurídicas a principios del siglo XX, los llamados casos insulares, se establece una diferencia por primera vez entre los territorios que Estados Unidos adquiere, clasificando unos como territorios incorporados y otros como territorios no incorporados. Esa teoría jurídica se basa en una interpretación. La Constitución de Estados Unidos no plantea una diferenciación entre territorios incorporados o no incorporados. Nos lleva esto hasta el 1898, cuando Puerto Rico es, eh, viene a ser parte de los Estados Unidos por un tratado, el Tratado de París de 1898, y entra como un territorio que después fue definido como no incorporado. En el 1917, sin embargo, el Congreso de los Estados Unidos concede la ciudadanía americana para todos los nacidos en Puerto Rico. Y desde entonces, los puertorriqueños son ciudadanos americanos por nacimiento. El problema es que si bien es cierto que ese proceso político histórico lleva una ruta en todos estos territorios, en el caso de Puerto Rico se sale de la norma. Primero, Puerto Rico es el territorio de los Estados Unidos que más tiempo ha estado bajo condición territorial que ningún otro territorio. Y eso incluye los territorios que después se convirtieron en estados algunos, o en el caso de las Filipinas que fue hacia la independencia. Ningún territorio ha estado tanto tiempo bajo la definición de territorio sin lograr finalmente la resolución de este problema. Porque el problema entonces tiene base en que los territorios, de acuerdo con la Constitución de Estados Unidos, permite el discrimen, pero nosotros no estamos pidiendo que ustedes emitan un juicio sobre si la Constitución interna de los Estados Unidos eh, eh, es compatible con la política pública adoptada bajo esa, esos preceptos. Lo que estamos pidiendo es que, dadas las condiciones de ahora, después de todo ese trayecto histórico, si ocurre en este momento, basado en los principios y los valores de la Declaración Americana, ocurre violación de derechos basados en el artículo 2, que es el concepto de igualdad bajo la ley, que definitivamente no aplica en Puerto Rico, o el artículo 20, que significa la, el derecho a, a votar y participar del gobierno, que en Puerto Rico tampoco existe. Así que no quiero que se confunda, porque veo que en la submisión de los Estados Unidos tratan de identificar esto como un problema eh, que se resuelve a base de las consideraciones internas de los Estados Unidos. Pero como manifesté en mis palabras inicialmente, esa misma constitución y constituciones de otros países a veces eh, han permitido lo que hoy se considera violaciones de derechos humanos. Así que lo que estamos pidiendo es que específicamente enfoquen en si basado en lo que es su autoridad y su responsabilidad de velar por los derechos humanos, esta situación de Puerto Rico como territorio que es incapaz de poder de participar en el gobierno o poder votar o participar equitativamente, entonces... Eso es lo que pedimos de esta, de esta comisión. Y les recuerdo a esta comisión que ustedes tienen un precedente interno de la comisión. En el año 2003, los ciudadanos americanos de Washington, D.C. plantearon este mismo caso, excepto que el caso de Puerto Rico ahora es mucho más dramático, porque los ciudadanos americanos de, de Washington, D.C. sí pueden votar por el presidente y el vicepresidente. Lo que, lo que pedían era representación a través de su voto en el Congreso. En nuestro caso, señalamos no solamente la falta de esa representación en el Congreso, sino también la falta de poder participar en la elección del presidente y vicepresidente. Así que, un caso mucho más dramático, pero basado en un caso que ya ustedes resolvieron 
en el 2003, bajo los mismos principios, que es lo que le pedimos a esta comisión que haga. I think my initial feeling was the right one, that we should ask all the questions and then you answer <laughs> all together. We'll be here until evening. I, I invite um, Executive Secretary Paulo Abreu to make his intervention. Muchísimas gracias. Mi pregunta es muy objetiva. A los derechos humanos políticos también corresponden obligaciones. Eh, le pregunto si, si hay obligaciones políticas que hoy los ciudadanos puertorriqueños no cumplen. Y, y si hay, si ustedes estarían dispuestos a también empezar a internalizar estas obligaciones políticas para corresponder a un eventual derecho humano a, a votar eh, dentro del marco de una decisión que, que se puede tomar en ese sentido. Bueno, eh... Yo creo que su señalamiento es muy apropiado, válido. Esto es derechos y responsabilidades. En Puerto Rico estamos dispuestos a aceptar eso. Se pone como argumento de que los puertorriqueños eh, no tienen que pagar contribuciones personales sobre ingresos, pero como dije en mis palabras iniciales, eh, los puertorriqueños pagamos muchas contribuciones federales. Si la pregunta es si estamos dispuestos a asumir todas las responsabilidades en igualdad de condiciones, la contestación es sencillamente que sí. Responsabilidades y también los beneficios, ambos, no uno y no el otro. Following on your answer, have you, has Puerto Rico ever been asked whether you would be willing, this, the U.S. citizens in Puerto Rico have been asked whether you would be willing to pay personal income tax and any other obligations? The U.S. government has not formally asked, but we have formally answered the question before being asked. The answer is yes, and we have done so in public, free, and open plebiscites or referenda in the last five years, two times. In the 2012, one of the questions was, do we want to continue our current territorial or colonial uh, situation? The answer by 54% was no. The second question was, if not the, the territorial condition, what condition would you like to have? 61% voted for statehood. Fast forward to the last year, 2017, 97% of the people that participated in that plebiscite voted to opt for statehood. So, Madam President, yeah, we haven't been asked, but we have answered already. Yes, yes. yes. Um, Do you, do you believe that the reason why Puerto Rico is being treated in this way um, is because of racial discrimination? I would not dare say that. Even though, even though somebody might construe that this is a suspect group because Puerto Rico indeed is uh, almost exclusively Hispanic. Uh, and we speak Spanish, we speak English also, but we speak Spanish. And so my answer to that is no, I don't see any uh, racial intention here, although it's been argued, and I concede that maybe your, your question comes from this, that uh, this is indeed a discrete group that is being discriminated because of other reasons. Um, uh, actually, it was based on an, an experience I had with Puerto Rico when we, members of the Caribbean Association for Feminist Research and Action in Puerto Rico were um, preparing to go to the Beijing UN Beijing World Conference on Women's Rights, the largest conference ever held, and the great difficulty they had um, to go because the U.S. had 
its delegation um, already fixed to go, and Puerto Ricans had no place in the delegation. Anyway, in the end, we, the, our organization managed to find the money for them to go as private persons. So we had a great n number of reasons, and that was one of them. That's, that. Madam President, this is an anomalous situation, mm -hmm. and I urge you to at least state that it's something that has to be resolved. Yes. Um, I, I, um, my brother commissioner's question, I think, um, ought to be addressed to the state so that you can give us, I'm sure that you, hopefully you will in your answer, that why this difference of treatment um, between Puerto Rico, Puerto Rican U.S. citizens and other U.S. citizens. I, I, I must admit my mind cannot seem to grasp the reason why. It's because you're either a U.S. citizen or you're not. And if you're a U.S. citizen, surely you whether you live in Bangkok and you're a U.S. citizen, you're still a U.S. citizen entitled to, to, to rights as a U.S. citizen and the protection of the United States. So I really cannot understand the difference. And, and we in the Commission need to understand the Madam basis President, of the difference. Madam President, if I may. I'm asking the state oh. this question, not you. <laughs> You, I'm sorry, you have to do it at the no. end. No, no, they're going to do arguments. No, I, I, I'm just saying that this is it's a question for the state. You can do it in your, your, will, your submi yes, in our submissions. You don't have to answer it now. If I may, mm -hmm. consider the situation. Mm -hmm. It's not why would a citizen that lives in Puerto Rico is not afforded the same rights to vote for the president. Because the real anomalous part of this is that uh, if that citizen moves to one of the states, mm -hmm. he can vote. I he see. has all the rights. Okay. If a citizen yeah. of the United States, born in any of the states, mm -hmm. decides to move to Puerto Rico, they lose their rights. More than that, more than that, if that same citizen moves any place else, Italy. He moves to uh, France, or he moves to Argentina, or he moves or to Bangkok. Afghanistan, <laughs> or Bangkok. He can vote. He or she can vote. So uh, yeah. it's a. It, by it's even worse. It's even more confusing. So I'll wait. Is, I think we have to wait for right. the state. And I and I hope that the <laughs> government can answer. I hope so too. Why is it only in this hole? that uh, the rights of citizenship disappear. Hmm. Yep, it seems to be contained in the land mass. Yes, right. And that doesn't, that doesn't compute somehow. I will, I'll wait for the state to answer. I don't think I'm going to take up any more time because I will have an opportunity of final words. Um, so I, I um, next person, who is it? Yes, the petitioners now have, yeah, 12, uh, 12 and a half minutes each to, to make um, their submissions. Okay. Uh, buenos días a todos. Buenos días. Eh, este tiempo va a ser distribuido entre mí y mi hijo, el licenciado Gregorio Igartúa. Y yo lo anunciamos. Okay. Fue anunciado así. Yo soy el licenciado Gregorio Igartúa de la Rosa. Primero que nada, este, me reitero en lo que yo diga en términos de los documentos que ya están sometidos ante esta honorable comisión. En segundo lugar, quiero decirles y aclararles varias cosas a ustedes que yo entiendo pueden cooperar a que se entienda esta querella eh, luego de las muy excelentes eh, 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 expresiones del gobernador Rosselló. Eh, miren, nosotros no somos antiamericanos. Nosotros no somos proamericanos. Nosotros somos americanos, americanos de cuarta, quinta y sexta generación. Bien, en términos del voto, es muy bien lo que ha dicho el exgobernador, yo le voy a añadir algo. Aquí el problema es el siguiente, yo no puedo votar en Puerto Rico por el presidente de Estados Unidos ni por representantes. Sin embargo, si yo me quedo en Colorado o me mudo a un estado, sí puedo votar. Si vuelvo a Puerto Rico, pierdo el voto. Sin embargo... 
No, no, es sencillo. Si yo me voy a un país extranjero, aunque yo no tenga la intención de regresar a vivir de nuevo a los Estados Unidos, puedo seguir votando desde, desde Cuba, desde Corea, desde Rusia, este, en elecciones federales. Comprendo. ¿Qué pasa? El distinguido delegado de Estados Unidos dice, pero mira, en una forma irrespetuosa y discriminatoria, mudarse a los estados a votar, ¿a quién le dicen eso? Ni a los afro, afroamericanos no le dijeron que se mudaran para el norte cuando no podían votar en el sur. ¿Qué pasa? Él se le olvida que hay una clase que existe ya de más de 5 millones de ciudadanos americanos que residen fuera de Estados Unidos, es una clase de votantes que puede votar en elecciones desde todos esos países extranjeros porque se mudaron. Aclarado ese punto. Bien. Quiero también decirle lo de los casos insulares. O sea, Estados Unidos adquiría territorios para convertirlos en estados. Eso fue así hasta el 1901. En el 1901, el Tribunal Supremo en unas opiniones que se llaman los casos insulares, cambió la reglita. La reglita es del Congreso, que es el que tiene la facultad constitucional de decidir lo que se hace con los territorios. Pero vino el Supremo y estableció que los territorios eran para mantenerse como no incorporados o para incorporarlos. Incorporarlos cuando se entendieran que estaban capacitados sus ciudadanos a ser parte de la ciudadanía, de, de la familia americana. Todavía aquí acuden estos distinguidos compañeros a tratar y buscar de qué forma siguen con la misma regla de demostrarle a ustedes que nosotros no somos parte de la familia americana. Bien, otro asunto muy importante. Nosotros no somos pretenciosos. Ustedes dirán, contra, pero si Puerto Rico no es un Estado. ¿Cómo ustedes pretenden votar? Ah, pues es muy importante que ustedes sepan por qué queremos votar. En primer lugar, nosotros somos el único territorio que tiene la población mínima necesaria para votar por representante, por cinco, y para votar por el presidente. Simpatizo cristianamente con los demás territorios, pero el único que no necesita una enmienda para poder votar es el de Puerto Rico. Nosotros tenemos más de tres millones de habitantes, ten, votamos por... Este, este, somos ciudadanos americanos que cuando nos dieron la ciudadanía en el 17, no fue que nos la dieron nos preguntaron, ustedes quieren ser ciudadanos americanos y 99.9 digo, queremos ser ciudadanos americanos, igual que para el tratado de París, que éramos ciudadanos españoles y le preguntaron a todo el mundo ustedes quieren seguir siendo ciudadanos españoles o ustedes quieren ser nacionales bajo la custodia y patria potestad de los Estados Unidos, el 99% quiso dejar la ciudadanía española. Entonces, nosotros este, aprobamos una constitución para regir nuestros asuntos internos, los demás, los demás territorios se rigen por una ley orgánica. Esa constitución se rige como rigen todos los estados. Todos los estados tienen una relación federalista con Estados Unidos, con la nación, y cada estado tiene su soberanía interna, esa es la soberanía que tenemos nosotros. Este, by the way, eh, se me olvidó decir que cuando no somos pro antiamericanos, hay muchos, a veces a, aparecen por ahí antiamericanos, puertorriqueños, pero viven en los estados, quiero que sepan, que viven en los estados, no se van a vivir para Puerto Rico. Bien, entonces, le juramos lealtad, a, las, a, la, a, la, a, la, a la a la constitución americana nosotros este, tenemos tribunales federales iguales que en todos los estados tenemos un comisionado residente nos cobran más de 3 billones pagamos más que algunos estados de contribuciones federales en Puerto Rico y nos aplican las leyes del Congreso ¿por qué el Congreso no ha querido incorporar a Puerto Rico? porque de facto lo somos yo sometí un documento que lo explica claramente hace tres semanas. No nos han certificado como tal. Somos un Estado prácticamente. ¿Por qué no nos han certificado? Porque quieren seguir con el jueguito de un mal perverso, perpetuado por medio de un ingenioso desafío al derecho doméstico e internacional. Entonces, nosotros, este, ¿qué otra razón hay? Esto ha creado una confusión en no certificarnos, porque sigue la cuestión de qué somos. Y miren, este caso hay que verlo, esta solicitud, 
como lo que somos, ciudadanos americanos, no como lo que podemos ser. Finalmente, Estados Unidos está en incumplimiento con, la, con los tratados internacionales eh, contrario a la, a, a la Convención de Viena de, 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 de negociar de buena fe y no, es, no respetan el pacto Sunselbanda y, y eso es lo que está pasando ahora mismo en Puerto Rico. Según ustedes, la Carta de Derechos hay daño por no tener derechos democráticos, daños económicos, perdemos 10 billones al año por no ser Estado, daños sociales, daños políticos, daños criminales. Esa, esa es el Estado de Puerto Rico. Muy respetuosamente solicitamos su atención a este caso que así lo necesita. Good morning to the Commission. While the Commission's record includes many historical facts relevant to this discussion, I reject the idea that it is our obligation to justify why we must be entitled to the enjoyment of our political rights. That would be contradictory. The real question is what compelling arguments could support policies that deprive us of these fundamental rights? In their answer to the complaint, the US government tries to oppose petitioner's argument by advocating a very archaic and watered down version of democracy and political participation. Arguments that contradict the very principles that serve as the cornerstones to both the nation and these organizations, <coughs> legal and, and political and philosophical foundations that explicitly contravene international law. Firstly, they proclaim that the American citizens of Puerto Rico have an adequate level of self-government self since we fully participate in the state and local political processes. As stated by Governor Rosselló, it is interesting that they are making this argument at a time when a federal oversight board with broad powers go at, that go as far as overriding local and state level decisions of these elected officials is in place. Political participation as a right is expressly recognized in, in multiple international instruments, including those cited in the complaint. And its delimitations have been clearly defined. For example, the UN Human Rights Committee, interpreting Article 25 of the ICCPR, has stated that effective political participation requires the formulation and implementation of policy at the international, national, regional, and local levels. <coughs> or lack of participation, particularly at the federal international levels, and now due to the board at the local level also, has placed us in a subordinate position, a state of structural disadvantage with strong social and economic implications. Secondly, the State Department declares that the American constitutional system precludes the residents of Puerto Rico from voting and electing officials. This argument fails to recognize that state discretion with regard to the rights of its citizens, at least under international law, is not absolute, but limited to reasonable non-discriminating conditions. Distinguishing between the US citizens living in Puerto Rico and those living in the states for purpose of the right to vote, eligibility for public office, or access to rights is neither reasonable nor objective. If these arguments were valid, then there would never be human rights violations, since most governmental actions are made under the pretext of law. Obviously, most actions are either constitutional or legal, but that doesn't mean that they are legal under international law or that they are moral. Thirdly, the US State Department proposes a very unique solution to our human rights efficiency. They invite us to move to any of the 50 states, and this has been discussed previously. But I would like to say that it that in itself is a recognition of discrimination due to residency. This argument is not only disrespectful, but the US would be outraged if any other member state suggested a similar solution to a human rights complaint. We must stress that the Inter-American Democratic Charter not only recognizes the right to democracy, but it defines its essential elements and the obligation to promote and defend it. Indisputably, these arguments are not present. I will uh, briefly take two more issues. First, they argue that we approved the, cor the current relationship and we knew we have full knowledge of its limitations. However, besides the plebiscites that have been discussed, basic human rights 
including those herein being discussed, cannot be either, either be delegated or surrendered. The notion of such delegation contradicts the very, the very principles of democracy and human rights. Finally, the fact that after more than a century, the United States has not provided its citizens with a royal opportunity to enjoy these rights constitutes a blatant violation of their duties under international law. While some may try to defend, rationalize, or even justify discrimination, let it be known that discrimination will never be just, will never be rational, and will never be dignified. We urge this honorable commission that its determination reflect these basic principles. I, I believe it's my, my turn now for 12 and a half minutes. Thank you for the opportunity to address you again. Again, my name is Orlando Vidal, and I represent petitioners in the Rosillo case. Our case presents broader questions than Mr. Igor to us. We raise not only the right to vote for president, but also the right to full political participation. I'll focus on three points only. Number one, the applicable international legal instruments. Second, the applicable legal standards. And third, some brief remarks on the issue of status. Turning first to the applicable legal instruments, the main one, of course, is the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to stress that by no means is this the only one. There are other <laughs> instruments that should inform the Commission's evaluation of the issues at stake in these important cases. We don't have time to go over each of them in detail, but we did discuss them in our written submissions. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the very charter of the Organization of American States, the American Convention, and the Democratic Charter. But again, the main document we base our claims on is the American Declaration. This commission has recognized that the American Declaration is a source of international obligations for all OAS member states including those that have not ratified the American Convention like the United States. We base our claim specifically on Article 2, the right to equality before the law, Article 17, the right to be recognized as persons deserving of civil rights, and Article 20, the right to vote for and to participate in our national government. Now turning to the applicable legal standards, in our submission on the merits, we describe the standards applicable to each of the asserted violations under the American Declaration. In the interest of time, I will focus now only uh, on Article 20 and rely on the other two on our briefs. Under Article 20, the Commission applies a three-part test. First, the Commission considers whether the right to vote has been curtailed beyond the only permissible limitations listed in the American Convention. Age, nationality, residence, language, education, civil and mental capacity, or sentencing by a competent court in criminal proceedings. None of these limitations applies here, not even the limitation on residence, since residents of Puerto Rico indeed reside in the United States. Second, the Commission considers whether the imposed limitations curtail the very essence and effectiveness of the right to vote and to participate in government. Since the U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico cannot vote for president, vice president, senators, or voting representatives to the House and Congress, we cannot see how anyone could reasonably claim that the very essence and effectiveness of the right to vote and to participate in government had not been curtailed. It's no exaggeration to say that, in fact, they have been utterly obliterated. Third, upon meeting the first two prongs of this three-part test, the burden shifts to the United States to establish that the limitations on its citizens in Puerto Rico are reasonable, objective, and proportionate. 
In the 12 years that we've been litigating these cases, the United States has offered no argument or any shred of evidence why these limitations are reasonable, objective, and proportionate. We submit that is because they are not. With all due respect, this isn't even a close question. Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory. In this territory live three and a half million American citizens. As with all citizens, the U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico are subject to federal law and more recently to local federal supervision in the form of an oversight board under PROMESA. They cannot vote for voting representatives or senators who represent their constituents' interests in drafting the laws to which they're subject. They cannot vote for the president who executes and enforces the law and who as commander-in-chief leads our service men and women in war. Of particular relevance this week, they cannot even participate in the political process that leads to the appointment of federal judges who interpret the law. Because again, they cannot vote for the president who nominates them, nor for the senators who advise and consent on their nominations. They have absolutely no effective political participation at the federal level. But the decisions made at the federal level materially affect the lives of U.S. citizens in Puerto Rico in innumerable, innumerable and most significant of ways. We trust the Commission will see through the fog and arrive at the correct conclusion, and that is that the United States is indeed, regrettably, violating its Puerto Rican citizens' rights under the American Declaration. My last point. My last point relates to the issue of Puerto Rico's political status. In opposition to our cases, the United States has argued that it cannot extend voting rights to its citizens in Puerto Rico because it's not yet a state. And under our Constitution, only citizens of state and the District of Columbia have the right to vote for president and vice president, and only state citizens have the right to vote for senators and voting representatives. But the United States is mischaracterizing the issue. The issue, as Governor Rosillo said, is not what the U.S. Constitution requires, but what human rights standards demand, specifically those provided by the American Declaration. Opponents of equality for the United States citizens of Puerto Rico have asked this commission to reject petitioners' claims based on their interpretation of the right to self-determination. Individuals' right to vote and the collective right to self-determination are independent and yet complementary under international law. They are not mutually exclusive. The U.S. has consistently argued that the issues in these cases involve political processes within the U.S. Congress, but it's a process that the U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico are utterly excluded from. Recognition and implementation of the right to vote would give U.S. citizens in Puerto Rico a seat at the table, a real hand in their political future. The right to vote is effectively the gateway to full self-determination. In any event, of these two rights, only the individual right to vote is included in the American Declaration, which is the applicable source of international law in these cases. We are confident that this Commission's decision in these important cases will be status neutral and in no way, shape, or form limit Puerto Rico's collective right to self-determination. In Statehood Solidarity Committee, this Commission held that the United States is violating the rights of its D.C. citizens by depriving them of voting representation in Congress. This Commission recognized that the right to vote should be enjoyed by all D.C. citizens regardless of whether the political status of our nation's capital remains that of a specially carved out federal district, whether D.C. becomes a state, whether the Constitution is amended to extend full voting rights to D.C. As a, as a separate geographic jurisdiction, whether sovereignty is returned to Maryland, or whether there is any other change, constitutional or statutory, in the district's political status. The Commission also rejected in that case the attempted justification based on the District of Columbia's special status offered by the United States. This Commission should similarly reject the United States' claim 
that Puerto Rico's status is, to quote the government, distinctive, exceptional. It isn't special. Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States. All we're asking the Commission is to declare that while Puerto Rico remains part of the United States, while Puerto Ricans remain U.S. citizens, and while these citizens are subject still to federal law, they're entitled to vote at the federal level under internationally recognized human rights principles. In these cases, the issue is not status. The issue is human rights. Human rights do not depend on the political status of a territory. The Universal Declar Declaration of Human Rights and the ICCPR make this clear. The rights we seek. The rights we seek are due to Puerto Ricans under international law as human beings. As human beings and citizens and residents of the United States, subject to federal law regardless of the colonial status of the island. There's perhaps no more sacred right in a democracy than the right to vote. It's sacred because every other right depends on it. The vote is the only basis for the legitimate exercise of power. It's the most effective way people anywhere are not only able to hold their governments accountable, but also empowered to shape the course of and improve their lives. The next congressional elections are 32 days away. And again, in that election, the US citizens of Puerto Rico will be deprived of the right to elect senators and any voting representatives to Congress. The election after that will include the presidential election in 2020, a little over two years from now. We urge the commission to resolve our cases as soon as possible, if not before the midterm elections, then well in advance of the next presidential election so that the United States has the benefit of your decision and the time to implement the necessary remedial measures and the U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico are finally able to exercise their fundamental right to vote. Thank you for scheduling this important hearing, for your attention today, for your consideration during the past 12 years, and for the important work you do to promote and protect human rights in the Americas. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and I must thank the um, rep, um, petitioners for keeping within time, um, even though you exceeded yours a little bit. But they made it up for you. I now invite the, the, the representatives of the, the United States of America to make their submissions. You have 35 minutes, as agreed. No. Thank you, Madam President. And before we begin, um, I just want to say we take issue with the pointing at us and claiming some sort of individual discriminatory or racist motive. I think it's something that we should stick to the motives of the petition. We should stick to the merits of the petition rather than anonymous attacks directed at people who are here representing the United States government. Distinguished commissioners, secretary of colleagues, governors, governors, secretary of state, president of the Senate, speaker of the House, welcome to Denver. We're honored that you are here. Thank you to the commissioners for the opportunity to present the United States position on the Igarta and the Roseo petitions. We appreciate the commission's efforts to review these submissions. Having said that, on all counts, we think the petitions fail to state a claim, and we disagree with the facts as they have been represented by the petitioners. Both petitions raise the same fundamental issue, the scope of federal representation accorded to the residents of Puerto Rico under the United States Constitution. This is a domestic political issue, if there has ever been one. one which, to our opinion, has yet to be decided. There's been a lot of mention regarding a referendum um, and the referendum's results. And I think it's important that the Commission take into context the different options for Puerto Ricans. The options that have traditionally been presented are independence, statehood, or status quo. And I think one thing for the Commission to understand in coming to their uh, conclusion is that there's no consensus around a single solution. And as you review self-determination and as you review the principles that are contained in the declaration, it's very important. I think the petitions, the view that's been presented is that there's unanimous or close to unanimous consent as to our single solution. But we could state as to the referendum that was held in 2017, 97% of the participants favored statehood, but only 23% of the population participated. 
when historically over 80% of Puerto Ricans participate in referendums. And prior to 2017, each had favored maintaining Puerto Rico's current status. Because as you said, Mr. Arboro, with the obligations and the rights also come the responsibilities. The Guarta petition focuses on the participation in U.S. presidential elections. The Roseo petition focuses on participation both in presidential as well as the congressional elections. Given the similar legal and factual issues here, we have consolidated our responses to both petitions and we encourage the commission to do the same. We hope consolidation will also help the commission start to clear the backlog of cases like this one, which have been pending now for over a decade. The petitions are framed in terms of voting rights. However, these petitions are really about the political status of Puerto Rico as a commonwealth in the United States federal system. As a commonwealth, Puerto Rico does not have voting representation in the U.S. House of Representatives and the Senate, or voting electors in the Electoral College, just as any other non-state territories in our federal union. Residents of Puerto Rico, as the U.S. citizens, are free to reside in the United States that do have voting representation and voting electorates to de as delineated by the United States Constitution <coughs> and to participate in elections for those representatives and electors. The United States Constitution's allocation of representative and electors with the respect to Puerto Rico is not inconsistent with the Inter-American Declaration or the Inter-American Democratic Charter. Nothing in the, inter in the American Declaration titles Puerto Rico's to statehood in the U.S. federal system. I will address this in more detail in a few minutes. But it bears emphasizing at the onset that these petitions plainly seek to litigate the political status of Puerto Rico before this commission. The commission should not allow itself to be used in this way. On behalf of the U.S. government, we reiterate our request that the Commission dismiss both petitions in their entirety and wrap up these cases promptly. The petitions are totally without merit and an attempt to convert a domestic political matter into a human rights matter. The question of Puerto Rico's legal status is, is under consideration now within the United States. Just last year, the residents of Puerto Rico voted in an island-wide public referendum to pursue statehood. The government of Puerto Rico is now pursuing that path, path as we see here today energetically. Finally, I urge the Commission to focus on the subject of these petitions. This hearing is not about the scope of, in, of effectiveness or ineffectiveness of hurricane relief efforts after Hurricane Maria, nor are these petitions about the scope of federal relief efforts in Puerto Rico's fiscal crisis, and the question of the political status of Puerto Rico within the U.S. federal system is well beyond the competence of this Commission. The petitioners will seek to have their commissions merge all these issues together and somehow identify violations of, American, of the American Declaration. Before I turn to the merits of the petitions, I must make one observation about the competence of the Commission. The only relevant instrument which the Commission will, could be competent to evaluate in relation to the conduct of the United States would be the non-binding American Declaration. Article 27 of the Rules of Procedure directs the Commission to consider petitions regarding alleged violations of the human rights enshrined in the American Convention of Human Rights and other applicable instruments. Article 23 of the rules, in turn, identifies the American Declaration as an applicable instrument with respect to non-parties to the American Convention. Although Article 23 lists several other instruments, the United States is not a party to any of those instruments. Thus, for the United States, the American Declaration is the only applicable instrument. However, in its 2017 admissibility report on the petition, the Commission indicated its intent to take into account the terms of the Inter-American Democratic Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the Inter-American Covenant on civil and political rights in the present case. Under the rules of procedure, the application of instruments beyond the American Declaration in this present case would be manifestly <clears throat> improper and beyond the competence of the Commission. Turning now to the merits of the petition, the United States Constitution governs how states are represented in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, and how states participate in the Electoral College, which choose the President. Article 1 of the United States Constitution, the supreme law of our land, establishes apportionment of representatives and senators amongst the states. Article 2 of the Constitution and the 12th Amendment provide the procedure for electing the president and vice president by states through the Electoral College. As a result, pursuant to Article 1 of the U.S. Constitution, senators and U.S. representatives are elected by the people of the states. Pursuant to Article 2 of the U.S. Constitution, the president of the United States is chosen by electors, and those electors are chosen by the states. This is one significant exception to those rules and the only non-state within the United States that chooses presidential electors is the District of Columbia, which acquired that right by an express amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America adopted in 1961. Citizens of the United States are free to reside in whichever state they wish. 
Other provisions under the U.S. Constitution govern how the U.S. territories may evolve into U.S. states. Specifically, Article 4 of the Constitution provides for the admission of new states. Consistent with that process, a number of territories have become U.S. states over time. And my colleague, Thomas Weatherall, will uh, further elaborate on that point. Right, thank you, Ambassador. Yes, yeah, so the United States Constitution provides the process for attaining statehood. Article 4, Section 3, Clause 1 authorizes the Congress to admit new states into the United States beyond the 13 already in existence at the time the Constitution went into effect. This provision is often referred to as the New States Clause. The clause of the Constitution reads as follows. New states may be admitted by the Congress into this union, but no new state shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state nor any state be formed by the junction of two or more states or parts of states without the consent of the legislatures of the states concerned as well as of the Congress. As this clause indicates, the admission of states to the Union is a political process that resides with Congress and not with the executive branch. Historically, after the residents of a territory have made their interest in statehood known to the federal government, Congress has passed an enabling act and in the past, such an enabling act has set out the mechanism by which a territory could be admitted as a state, which would often entail certain conditions and the submission of a proposed state constitution to Congress. And this practice suggests how Congress might proceed if Puerto Rico were to seek admission into the Union as a state. However, I should take this opportunity to recall um, that the petitioners do not represent Puerto Rico in any official capacity. And I would also respectfully recall that the question of Puerto Rico's political status is beyond the competence of the commission. Thank you, Thomas. And as we've mentioned, Puerto Rico, however, is not a state. Accordingly, under the U.S. Constitution, residents of Puerto Rico enjoy U.S. citizenship and all of the rights and benefits thereof, but do not participate directly in presidential or congressional elections because Puerto Rico is not a state. And under Articles 1 and 2 of the United States Constitution, only states are represented by voting electors, senators, and U.S. representatives. This does not mean that residents of Puerto Rico somehow enjoy fewer rights than other U.S. citizens. If a resident of Puerto Rico wants to participate fully in presidential or congressional elections, the Constitution does not bar them from doing so, providing they move and reside within a state of the United States. I want to disagree here a moment to correct the record. It is clearly not true, as petitioners allege, that the residents of Puerto Rico have no political voting rights at the federal level. Puerto Rico residents can, among other things, vote in the presidential primaries for the purpose of choosing party candidates for president. Puerto Rico residents also can vote in congressional elections, both in primary and in general elections. Thus, the residents of Puerto Rico do enjoy, re enjoy representation at the federal level. The difference in federal election participation between residents of U.S. states and residents of territories arises from the very nature of state under the, under the U.S. Constitution. Through the Constitution, the people of the United States created a federal union. The federal union provided for the distribution of political power among the states within that union. Within that structure, states that elected to, be, to join the union gave a portion of their sovereignty. They took on certain responsibilities, and they also took on obligations. They also, acquire, they also acquired at the same time certain rights, including the rights to choose the president, the vice president, and members of Congress. If Puerto Rico wishes to participate differently in this process, it must comply with the requirements under our Constitution to become a state. And as, com as the Commission knows, the Governor of Puerto Rico is vigorously pursuing this statehood path currently. Pursuing statehood is not just a theoretical possibility. Recall that Puerto Rico's legal status has evolved significantly throughout the course of the 20th century. It has evolved from being a territory in 1898 to its current status as a self-governing commonwealth. It can continue to evolve and join a number of U.S. territories which have been admitted to the states, to the Federal Union, during the course of their history. The Commission's role is not to help Puerto Rico bypass the political process of achieving statehood through a basis claim of discrimination. It is also not the Commission's task to influence a process or promote a particular outcome in that campaign. Puerto Rico's legal status is governed by the U.S. Constitution, Constitution which reflects a careful balancing of the rights of federal governments, the states, and the territories. Moreover, the U.S. Constitution's structure of federal representation does not violate Articles 2, 17, 18, or 20 of the American Declaration, nor does it violate any provision of the Inter-American Democratic Charter. I will highlight some key considerations in support of our position. 
Article 2 of the Declaration focuses on the right to equality before the law. The U.S. Constitution structure of federal representation does not constitute unequal treatment within the meaning of Article 2, the American Declaration. The difference in the political representation of states and other territorial entities under our federal system is not based on race or on sex, on language, creed, or any other in individual distinctions barred by Article 2. Rather, it arises from the very nature of statehood under the U.S. Constitution. There is nothing discriminatory in this constitutional structure. U.S. citizens reside in Puerto Rico enjoy the same freedoms to move at will within the United States, to establishing residencies at any time in any other state. As, as state residents, those U.S. citizens have the same voting rights as any other state resident to participate in elections for the state's federal representatives and electors. Similarly, U.S. citizens, US citizens residents in any of the states may at any time move to Puerto Rico and establish residency there at which time they could not directly participate in presidential and congressional elections because Puerto Rico, as a commonwealth, does not have voting federal representatives or electors. Nothing in Article II or elsewhere in the American Declaration suggests that parties may not maintain federal systems in which their citizens participate in federal elections is determined by the residence or the status of the federal entity in which they reside. Article 17 of the Declaration provides that every person has the right to be recognized everywhere as a person's having the right and obligation and enjoy the same basic civil rights. Residents of Puerto Rico are U.S. citizens and enjoy the same civil rights as all residents. With respect to participation in federal elections, the same rules apply to all citizens of the United States. Residents of Puerto Rico are recognized everywhere in the United States as persons having rights and obligations and entitled to enjoy basic civil rights. Petitioners have failed entirely to present a cognizable claim under Article 17 of the Declaration. Article 18 of the Declaration provides that every person may resort to the courts to ensure respect for his or her legal rights. Residents of Puerto Rico have access to courts of the United States just as any other citizen of the United States. As noted in our written submission, petitioner's claim here is really about the legal status of Puerto Rico. And the question of Puerto Rico's legal status has been litigated repeatedly before the United States courts, including the Supreme Court. Most notably, the Supreme Court took up two cases involving the legal status of Puerto Rico within the last year. Petitioner, he, petitioner himself has pursued claims similar to those raised in the petition before this commission before federal courts. The notion that residents of Puerto Rico have somehow been denied access to U.S. courts is fanciful. Petitioners have failed to state a claim under Article 18. What Article 18 of the Declaration does not provide is that the court will always side with petitioners' views. To the extent that the Commission proposes to analyze whether alleged, allegedly contradictions and restrictions decisions of federal courts could constitute a violation of the petitioner's rights to, to effective judicial remedy, this evaluation of domestic ju judicial decisions would run afoul of the Commission's fourth insta formula. The fourth insta formula recognizes a proper role of the Commission as subsidiaries to states' domestic ju judiciaries, and indeed, Nothing in the American Declaration, the OAS Charter, the Commission statutes, or the rules give the Commission the authority to act as an appellate body. The Commission has elaborated on the limitations that underpin the fourth instance formula in the following terms. The Commission lacks jurisdiction to substitute its judgment for that of the national courts on matters that involve their interpretation and the explanation of domestic law or the evaluation of facts. It is not the Commission's place to sit in judgment as another layer of appeal, second-guessing the considered decisions of a state's domestic court in weighing evidence and applying domestic law. Nor does the Commission have the resources or requisite expertise to perform such a task. Article 20 of the Declaration provides that every person having legal capacity is entitled to participate in the government of his country directly or through his representatives and to take part in popular elections which shall be set by secret ballot and shall be honest, periodic, and free. The residents of Puerto Rico have that right. The residents of Puerto Rico, for example, elect their own governor and Senate and House of Representatives. They also have the right to vote in the U.S. elections in various capacities and even have the right to vote repeatedly on our fundamental legal relationships with the United States periodically throughout the public referendum. And as noted earlier, the residents of Puerto Rico are represented by an elected delegate to the United States House of Representatives known as the resident commissioner. As such, residents of Puerto Rico participate in both government of their country as well as popular elections. But the Declaration does not dictate the exact modalities of such participation in elections. Specifically, there is no indication, for example, whether political 
participation may or may not be effectuated through federal states. There is also no indication of whether political participation should be by a majority or a proportional rule. Whether there should be a popularity, a popularly elected president, mayors, regional councils, a parliamentary system, bicameral system, federalism, or any other specific feature of democratic participation. Further, there is no allegation that petitioners are prevented from residing anywhere they choose within the United States, including the states where they could participate in different federal elections. Similarly, Article 20, nor any other provision of the American Declaration mandates that every federal office be subject to universal popular election by every citizen. Petitioners suggest, for instance, that Article 20 requires the United States to permit the popular election of federal judges. However, nothing in Article 20 supports that claim. In the United States, federal judges are appointed under the Constitution by the President with the advice and consent of the United States Senate. Moreover, the idea that a state's constitution can regulate representation at the federal level is not dissimilar to the decision taken by some, by some nations to exclude overseas residents from voting in elections or otherwise restrict participation in elections based on duration of stay abroad. Finally, petitioner's suggestion that participation in particular U.S. federal election is an intrinsic human right that flows from citizenship is simply not supported by the plain text of the American Declaration. There is no legal basis for the commission to interfere, to, to infer that right here. In sum, there is good reason for the commission to exercise restraint in considering these two petitions. Constitutional issues surrounding the appropriate framework of federal entities are complex political issues that far exceed the competence of the commission. <laughs> As a result, we believe that both petitions fail to state claims that warrant the Commission's review. Therefore, we respectfully request the Commission dismiss both petitions in their entirety. The petitioners would have you believe that dismissing the petitions as, as they put, it would be turning a, blind eye, turning a blind eye to the unfinished business of the American democracy. All democracies are works in progress. And an equally important point is that people of the state who have the responsibility to continue to perfect the state's democracy. It is not the task of the commission. That is not what the American Declaration requires. It is not what the Declaration states. The United States is a vibrant democracy and will continue to remain a, dem a democracy and work with Puerto Rico as part of our federal union. Thank you. Um, the, now there will be questions from the Commission, uh, NAS and the Commission. Um, I invite um, the first Vice President to make her <coughs> intervention, <coughs> statements, uh, comments, or questions. Muy buenas tardes ya. Gracias, señora Presidenta. Mi saludo respetuoso a los peticionarios en esta reunión de fondo, de audiencia, a la ilustre representación de los Estados Unidos. Eh, yo quisiera que se me permitiera, señora Presidenta, ¿es posible? Vamos a apagarlo. Eh, más que una pregunta, es una reflexión que me surge de la, los planteamientos que han hecho ambas partes. Y es eh, la reflexión de un concepto de un derecho humano fundamental, el, la ciudadanía. Y quisiera tener eh, la, la posición de... La reflexión para escuchar eh, los planteamientos. Y la hago en razón de que eh, personalmente he tenido eh, una experiencia en lo que representa en eh, eh, el reconocimiento de la ciudadanía por nuestras constituciones. Y la demanda, la exigencia para otorgar la ciudadanía está muy vinculada esencialmente 
con el derecho al voto, el derecho a elegir y ser elegido. Algunas de las constituciones del de continente eh, dice eh, normas expresas de la constitución son ciudadanos, y voy a hacer <coughs> referencia a mi país, son ciudadanos panameños las personas que alcanzan la mayoría de edad, mayores de 18 años. Y la, el efecto de esta disposición, que la he cuestionado en razón a las personas menores de edad, los que no cumplen 18 años todavía, eh, no son ciudadanos. Y hay un, hay un cuestionamiento, ¿cómo no van a ser ciudadanos? La respuesta es, es que la ciudadanía está vinculada estrictamente al poder ejercer derechos políticos y particularmente el ejercicio del derecho al voto. Entonces, en, en esta petición, eh, la competencia de la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos está es en la valoración precisamente del de poder ejercer este derecho de manera plena. Y cuando las mujeres no teníamos el derecho a ejercer el voto, decíamos que no éramos ciudadanas plenas. Entonces, un poco esta reflexión para colocar en, la, en, 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 el, en el cuestionamiento, en la evaluación, el estudio que nos corresponde en este, en este caso, o en los dos casos, es una valoración del derecho humano que constituye esen la, la esencia de la ciudadanía. Muchas gracias. I, I now invite, um, no? Oh, oh, no? 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 Oh, we're going to be very short. I, I, I myself, I, I, I think, um, it is a fundamental right of every citizen to vote in all uh, civil political elections in the country. I, I don't think that's a, that can be gainsaid. It's, it's part of, it's a fundamental right of a citizen. But uh, um, we have heard from both sides and uh, um, I just wish to ask both parties to send to us whatever additional information you may have, send it in writing, <laughs> you may have, um, um, so that we, we can properly consider um, the matter and come to a, a correct resolution of, of this, these cases. And, and I think it is, uh, they're vitally important, and I thank um, the petitioners for requesting this hearing and bringing this matter for our consideration. And I extend my thanks to the ambassador for being here himself and, and participating actively and making your respond, the United States responses yourself to these proceedings. It's very important when a state um, um, participates in the way you have, and we thank you um, for that. Be and before I close, I just would like Yes, I, that's what I was just going to say. Um, um, I just wanted to, in fairness, we will extend our sitting into our lunch hour by giving both sides seven and a half minutes for closing statements. Um, I know you are in a great hurry. I thought it would end up one 
of a, a 3.30 flight. Yes. I don't want to be disrespectful yes. and leave I, in the I, middle I, of the hearing. I, so. I, I know. I was just going to mention that, that if, if you do not wish to make a closing I, statement. Not that we don't wish to, is that I have a 3.30 yeah. flight out of Denver, and I still have to return a rental car and pack my bags, and I don't want to have to miss <laughs> my flight. And I, I thought we would finish at 1 o'clock yes, sharp. Yes, I, as I was hope noticed. so, too, and I hope so, too. Do, do, do you I'm, I'm going to respectfully excuse myself because right. I need to make right. my flight. But thank you. But you will be here, Andrew? And yes. Yes. Thank you very much. And thank you again, and travel safely home. Um, yes, you will have seven and a half minutes for your closing comments. This is a, we, we are regulated, so, you know. Okay. Yes, but now, now you can start to make your comments. Well, seven uh, and a half minutes for all. For all, okay, I'll take three and a half. Okay, mm -hmm. well, you want. Okay, first of all, in 2000, mm -hmm. uh, the Federal Court of Puerto Rico decided in a case I submitted mm -hmm. uh, the Honorable Governor Rosselló, who was the governor of Puerto Rico then, mm -hmm. and the court decided for us that we could vote. Mm -hmm. The United States, which has not taken any affirmative action in our favor to vote, mm -hmm. this uh, uh, appeal the case, mm -hmm. and a week before, mm -hmm. uh, the, the case was, the opinion was revoked, mm -hmm. and two million ballots were burned in American soil, okay? Mm -hmm. Two months ago, I uh, had the case of requesting the right to vote for representative mm -hmm. and exhausted the remedies. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know that we are not pretentious. Of seven judges in the appeals court, three of them decided for us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. then I also wanted to tell you that this case, as I said, has to be decided not on what we can hypothetically be in two years or five. We are American citizens. It has to be there. And then the case, the case of uh, of uh, Dorton, U.S. versus Dorton, decided that the the citizenship is the basis of the right to vote. We are paying right now a hundred and a million dollars in penalty to comply the U.S. government, so that the government guarantees that the Constitution is fully applicable to protect the American citizens of Puerto Rico. So, so that's what I said, that they, they switch on and off the Constitution, and this is not a matter of what can we are. We are, we are American citizens in a de facto state, in a de facto state. Okay. I have two brief comments, uh, very, very briefly. Number one, I, I want to stress that uh, the United States, yes, uh, the United States, uh, uh, the presentation uh, seems to give the impression that the U.S. Uh, constitutional interpretation of the relationship between Puerto Rico and our rights has been consistent th throughout the last hundred years, and that's clearly not correct. You know, it's it's very contradictory, and we are uh, full American citizens sometimes when it's convenient, and some other times not so much. And finally. Um, they fail to address most uh, uh, of human rights, uh, uh, the, na the nature of the human rights issues involved. They are stressing, uh, uh, I would characterize as a 19th century sovereignty uh, perspective. Uh, human rights, uh, by their very nature, are a limit to state sovereignty. They are not incompatible, but they are a limit. If not, then, as I stated earlier, there would never be human right violations because most actions are made under the guise of law. I, I, I don't know how much time I have, but I'll make it very, very quick. Three minutes? Four, Four minutes. minutes, okay. Hopefully I won't take that time. You can see the passion in this room. This is very much a family dispute. And as we all know, very often, Family disputes are the most heated of disputes. We love our country, but our country is not doing right by three and a half million of its citizens in Puerto Rico. I appreciate the comments of our government. Uh, I appreciate the constitutional lessons that they have tried to impart the commission and maybe us as well. But this is not a complex matter. We have been at this for 120 years, mm -hmm. 101 years with um, the enjoyment of our U.S. citizen. 
citizenship. And we agree very much with the comments made by you, Commissioner Trotinho, um, that citizenship means very little when you do not have the right to vote. But we are not, in all due respect, only arguing that it is citizenship that gives us the right to vote. It is citizenship, it is residence in the United States, mm -hmm. and it's citizenship with residence under federal law. Those three things give us, should give us the right to vote. It would make a very interesting case to the commission and maybe some very good petitioners in the future will bring a case involving expats, uh, citizens abroad and whether under international law they will have the right to vote. But that is not the case here. We do not live abroad, as Governor Rosselló said. Mm -hmm. We live in the United States. We have more citizens in Puerto Rico than in 21 states. Uh, we will provide some more information later to the Commission on the results of the 2012 referendum, which the United States conveniently ignores, where the United States citizens also clear, of Puerto Rico clearly express their, their uh, choice for, for statehood. All I can uh, end with is, that, uh, is with the following. The United States urged you not to be allowed to be used in this way. Well, this is exactly the way you need to be used. <laughs> to declare clearly where there is a violation of human rights, that there is a violation of human rights, and you would be failing with all due respect in your duties by not being used, as the United States says, in this way. So we urge you to allow yourselves to be used in this way, which is the right way. Thank you again very much for your time and consideration. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, the representatives of the United States of America, please make your final submission, seven and a half minutes. Uh, thank you, President. I don't think we'll take seven and a half minutes. Um, <laughs> In representation of the U.S. mission uh, to the OAS, uh, uh, I'm Andrew Stevenson. I cover our human rights portfolio there uh, and work very closely with the ambassador and many of our colleagues in the department and the interagency. Uh, happy to provide some closing remarks, uh, essentially reaffirming, I think, what we've already stated publicly today, uh, which includes, of course, our support for the ongoing work of the commission, uh, both in the U.S., but, of course, throughout the hemisphere and the region. We appreciate the Commission's efforts to review the submissions here before us today. Mm -hmm. uh, having said that, on all the uh, counts, we, we reaffirm that we think the, the petitions fail to state a claim. We disagree with the facts as they have been represented by the petitioners. Again, we, we note that both petitions raise the same fundamental issue, the scope of federal representation accorded to residents of Puerto Rico under the U.S. Constitution. And we would note that this, again, is a domestic political issue, if ever there was one, under consideration by the Commission. The petitions are clearly framed in terms of voting rights. However, these petitions are really about the political status of Puerto Rico as a commonwealth in the U.S. federal system. The U.S. Constitution's allocation of representatives and electors with respect to Puerto Rico is not inconsistent with the American Declaration or the Inter-American Democratic Charter. It also bears reaffirming that these petitions plainly seek to litigate the political status of Puerto Rico before this commission. We continue to note that we, we don't think that's appropriate and is not an effective use of the commission's time and resources. Also, we would note uh, in closing that the question of Puerto Rico's legal status is one under consideration now within the United States. Just last year, the residents of Puerto Rico voted in the public referendum to pursue statehood. The government of Puerto Rico is now pursuing that path, clearly indicating there's domestic remedy, domestic discussion around this issue, and is obviously something being discussed within the framework of the United States. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Um, and for the, the time um, management um, <laughs> which you exercise. Um, before I close, I, sh I must <clears throat> acknowledge and um, express the Commission's thanks for the presence here. Um, 
of the um, Governor Ricardo Ros Rosello. Yes. Yes. No. Present Governor of Puerto Rico. Thank you. And um, the Honorable Luis Gerardo Rivera Marin, um, Secretary of State for Puerto Rico. Thank you for being here. Um, blah, 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 blah. The Honorable Thomas Rivera, um, President of Puerto Rico Sen Puerto Rican Senate. Thank you also for being here. And uh, this uh, Honorable Carlos Johnny Mendez Nunes, Speaker of the Puerto Rico House of Representatives. Thank you also for being here. And I thank all of those here present. I will not make any comment um, in relation to the content um, and substantial um, arguments which have been made before us, as I'm entitled to do in my closing address. I think we can save that for our decision at the end of the day in evaluating um, what has been argued here before us. Um, I just wish to thank the members of the public who have listened to the matter and um, the interpreters, and to you, Mr. R the, Mr. Uh, um, oh dear, Mr. Rosilio, governor, ex-governor of Puerto Rico, and witness in this matter. Your evidence was extremely clear and cogent, and we thank you for being here. And uh, we thank the technicians, and of course, all those who have assisted in this process. I thank the Secretariat members at the table with us. That being said, this hearing is at an end, and we will say goodbye as far as hearings are concerned, our final hearing for this 169th session. Thank you very much. <laughs>